Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. Okay, welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. As always, I'm here with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, Sucheta. I uh, fondly recall our previous conversations with today's guest. I'm sure we're in for a treat. Uh, anxious to continue learning from him. So uh, lead us off. Uh, where are we going today? You know, you're doing something right when, when a guest agrees to come back. So I am really <laughs> grateful. <laughs> so I'm going to start a little bit about why learning matters. You know, this is a podcast about executive function. And at heart of executive function is how do we manage our learning? So I, as a student, I want to share a, a quick tidbit about my journey as a student. I was a great student. Uh, my comprehension was solid, but my studying was very silent, quiet, and only limited to reviewing. I don't remember ever being quizzed by my parents. I was never provided with any study guides or questions. I'm talking about uh, K-12 to education. At that time, of course, uh, just I think the same holds true for you is we never had internet. Uh, I don't even remember having a concept called handouts. We had a, one textbook and we were highly encouraged to take ferocious notes. So one good thing that I came out when I uh, entered college was I was a very good note taker. But when I uh, began my uh, clinical work, uh, I got exposed to Tony Bazan's a phenomenal book called Mind Mapping. And I studied it. I started teaching it to my traumatic brain injury uh, college students. And that's what really got my interest going in this idea of effective learning. So now that I'm an adult, I um, am deeply committed to lifelong learning. I have many iterations of uh, note taking that I do. I have I come up with catchy titles to whatever I do. I uh, like to uh, write stories that pertain to anything I'm learning. And finally, I love to draw maps of my learning. So the reason I'm sharing, of course, is because of our guest. So the book that I'll be talking a lot about, it's called Make It Stick. And in that book, what I have one of my favorite quotes, which says, knowledge is more durable if it is deeply entrenched. So that brings me to our incredible guest, Dr. Mark McDaniel, who is a professor of psychology and brain sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. He also is a co-director of the Center of Integrative Research on Cognition, Learning, and Education. What's so interesting is he came uh, last time and he spent quite a bit of time talking to us, us about prospective memory, which is memory for the future. A uh, little bit more about him. To refresh our listeners' memory, Dr. McDaniel has served as associate editor of the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition, and as the president of Rocky Mountain Psychological Association and of Division Three of the American Psychological Association. He is highly celebrated, highly published, prolific uh, cognitive psychologist, and he is one of the co-authors with Peter Brown and Henry Rodiger of uh, the book that we'll be talking about, which is called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. So welcome, Mark, to our podcast again. Thank you, Sucheta. So your big book has made the research in learning and memory very much accessible to all, and we will be talking about it. But last time, I didn't get a chance to ask you, do you mind telling us a little bit about your own learning style? When you were a young student, how were your executive function skills and what point in your education or learning did you discover learn how to learn? Well, it's hard for me to recall my own executive skills when I was younger. I do remember that I was planful and organized so that if there were assignments to do, I would make sure that I set aside time to sit down and do those assignments. I don't recall anything about my strategies necessarily for studying for exams until I was in college. And in college, I think I was faced with the kind of situation that many, many students were faced with, maybe not you, Sucheta, but many others, which is that after taking the first, my first college exam, I got feedback that I wasn't learning so well. 
I got a C minus on my calculus exam. I was a math major. So this was uh, very stunning to me <laughs> in a <laughs> negative way. And I've talked to other students who have experienced exactly, precisely the same thing. They've done well in high school. They take the first university exam. It's usually down at a C minus or C level. And they have all of a sudden a wake up call, which is that I need to figure out how to learn in college courses where the material is more challenging, the pace is faster, the expectations are higher. So it was at that point, I think, that I was stimulated to think more about learning and what I needed to do. And one thing that I remember is that in my math classes previously, it had been enough for me to look at how a problem was done and maybe practice it a little bit, and then I was fine. In college, that wasn't nearly enough. What I needed to do was practice more solving, uh, to think more about how I was getting the solution, to think about the underlying principles. And when I regrouped at midterm and started doing that, then things went very well. But one of the points that we make in the book, Make It Stick, and one of the things that I learned at that point was that learning is hard. Learning takes work. It's not something that automatically occurs. It's not something that we necessarily intuitively know how to do. But instead, we do have to marshal purposeful strategies. In your world, Sujeta, we can say that your executive system has to start to reflect on what you're doing, modify on what you're doing, and be strategic in how you go about learning. So I, that, that's when I learned how to do it. And then I refined the strategies and later understood that I needed to engage in retrieval practice in order to be able to recall and use information during exam times. And then, of course, you want to be able to use that information at later points in time. So in your own training in neuropsychology, clinical neuropsychology, you weren't studying just to do well on an exam. You were studying so that you would have the expertise to later on serve clients and serve people that you were interacting with, helping. I think your point is well taken. The most important thing I think you said that it wasn't until you got the C minus that kind of shook you up a little bit to made and made you to uh, introspect and take a look at your own approach to learning. And it, I always say, thank God for those failures, because only then we will begin to suspect <laughs> our competence. <laughs> and uh, we will talk a little bit about that in our uh, conversation today. Now, let me set the stage for this discussion. Can you quickly define for us what is learning and why learning is so sticky? And one thing you did mention that learning is hard and it takes work. And I love the word, you have to marshal your strategies. I love that. So how do you, when you do this research in learning, how do you define it? When is learning considered completed? That's a complicated question, or maybe I should say it's a complicated answer. And it depends, I think, on what your, what your criteria are. So if your criterion is that somebody needs to remember definitions of terms, or definitions of new vocabulary, then learning would be completed when you're able to display memory for that information. Mm -hmm. If your definition is, I want somebody to be able to understand the general underlying principles of certain uh, chemical or physical or biological aspects or processes that we're learning, then you might say that learning involves being able to demonstrate transfer from one particular context to another, to one particular instantiation of a problem to another. So in that case, somebody evaluating learning would say, it's not sufficient to show me that you can remember how to solve the problem that we did in class. What I apply. want, yeah. right? What I want you to be able to do is to apply and generalize and show that you can solve similar problems that to the ones we did in class. So I think learning has different facets and the way that we need to demonstrate it in our career, 
in our in the classroom and so on is going to more clearly define exactly what your objectives are when you're trying to learn particular content. Lovely. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Yes. And then there is also a simple things that how do we learn how to charge your phone? And then when mm. you're at the airport and you don't have a cord, you have to take that and apply and borrow somebody's cord or something. So that kind of adaptive nature to it is not limited to content that on, on which you are tested. So the next question comes to my mind is, you know, there are lots of, you know, the, the field of learning is riddled with myths. <laughs> Learners uh, operate under uh, the myth uh, that misguides their learning, retention and overall success. What interesting thing I came across as I read your book and your work that you pointed out this uh, idea that uh, many of us harbor this notion that learning is and the way we retain is intuitive to humans, but your work shows that it is not. It's in fact opposite of that. <laughs> so can you share some of the myths that you have encountered as you, you began to study this as well as share this information? Yes, one big prominent myth. It can be captured in something known as the total time hypothesis. That hypothesis is that the more time you spend studying, or more particularly, the more you time you spend recycling information through your working memory, the better chance that information has of being stored in long-term memory. Or to put it more succinctly, the more time you spend with the material, the better you're going to learn it. And that's a big myth. And it's one that seems to align with an intuition that we have, which is the more I study, the more I'm going to learn. Uh, and that myth gets reified in the popular literature. So, Sujeta, I don't know if you are aware, but maybe six or seven years ago, there was a series that it, uh, some clearinghouse was uh, writing up information and then uh, that was distributed to a, a consortium called Newspapers in Education, NIE. And so every month or so, the newspapers would, would print one of the, one of the uh, pieces. And what I distinctly remember was that it was on how to prepare for a test. And it said, to prepare for a test, what you need to do is you need to study an item over and over and over again until it gets burned into your brain. And that is a huge myth because we know from basic memory research, many, many studies show that if you just keep recycling information over and over again <laughs> in working memory, it does not get burned into the brain. It's a very superficial kind of processing that makes you feel as if you've learned the information, but in fact, objectively, when you take the test, you have it. And this, this was one of my problems in this first test in college, was I just thought by just reading over and over again, I was going to learn the material and do well. Well, that is a big myth. That's not the way things work. But almost yeah, many, many students embrace this idea, this myth, this total time hypothesis. And I think it's one of the big obstacles to, to starting to formulate a more sophisticated idea about how to learn. Yeah, so, and I think what you're yeah. talking about, if I may interject, that you have no idea how uh, this is imprinted in uh, K-12 to education, this myth. It pervades. Uh, yes. There is no quick course correction that is introduced or discussed or even uh, revisited. And I've seen a lot of college websites and their study strategy or rather whatever resources, you know, section of their website talking about this as a method. <laughs> That's correct. Terrible. That's correct. You're absolutely correct. And it's it's dismaying. It, it, yes, it really is, because we, there's so much science that shows that that's not an effective method. So let's start with the first effective method, which is the self-testing process or retrieval, a value in practicing or engaging in retrieval. So it's uh, said to be one of the potent ways to cement information in your long-term uh, storage and transfer it from short-term to long-term storage. How does this work and why is it so potent? Well, there are a number of ideas about that, Sujeta. The most simple that we can talk about is that 
when you're given a test or when you need to use information, for example, you're at the airport, you need to charge your phone. The task at hand is to retrieve information from long-term memory. So retrieval practice, in fact, is precisely practicing exactly what you need to do when you demonstrate learning. On the other hand, looking at things over and over is, is not the kind of practice you need in order to retrieve information about why a cell phone is losing charge, what it needs to have in order to recharge. Or similarly, in every test that you'll take, you're, the demand is to retrieve information. In your professional life, many of the demands are to retrieve information from memory. So retrieval practice is, in fact, exact, precise practice in what you're going to have to do later to demonstrate learning. So that that's one way to look at it. To put it informally, we, in education, and most of us intuitively think the way to learn is to cram information into the head. <laughs> but in fact, part of learning is learning how to get information out of the brain, get information out of long-term memory. So retrieval practice helps you learn that. When you fail at retrieval, you get a sense of what you what things that you haven't elaborated enough, things that aren't as richly understood as you would like. So retrieval helps you understand what you don't know in a in the most accurate way possible. Secondly, as you're retrieving information, you're reinforcing or developing pathways that allow you to retrieve that information. These can be cognitive pathways. They can be neural pathways. So you're forming the rich pathways needed to get to that information. Retrieval, and I'll say this very slowly, retrieval is not a neutral event. It's not a neutral <laughs> process. Retrieval changes memory. It changes the brain. We think that it helps stimulate consolidation of information. So every time you retrieve, the idea is that memory trace becomes more labile and is open to further consolidation. So these are some of the reasons that retrieval helps. You know, I like what you mentioned just now, that there is a, a somehow this self-directed problem-solving component to, uh, to it, mm -hmm. uh, that where you need to recognize a need. So that means when you know a test is coming, you need to recognize that I will be required to retrieve. So let, let me do just dry run of that retrieval. And then also, once you try to retrieve and fail, then you say, uh-oh, maybe it wasn't learned in the first place. Exactly. <laughs> and I love this last comment that you made, which is it stimulates consolidation. And I think that's such a powerful thing that only people in the cognitive uh, neuroscience or cognitive psychology talk about that. But I see that completely absent from discussion in the field of education. So do you mind talking a quickly about a consolidation process? Well, Sujata, that is something that I'm not as well versed in. That, that um, It involves uh, neuronal activity. It involves neurons probably developing functional synapses, actually developing new dendritic material. So consolidation involves well, I don't want to use the word consolidation again. It involves <laughs> establishing these neural networks that give rise to information being stored in memory. So it creates, if you will, new neural pathways. So, mm. so the nervous system has these temporary activations, and those are ongoing as you're maybe learning. But then these activations can be more permanently inscribed into memory as consolidation occurs, as synapses become functional, as new dendritic material gets formed, as new areas on the dendritic axonal interface become more functional. That's what consolidation is, so a more permanent storage of the information in your neuronal networks. And that's a superficial overview. The cognitive neuroscientists could give a much more detailed picture of that. But I think that's pretty accurate at a general level. So I think uh, you describing this process triggered my thought about this myelination process, which is kind of 
putting the layers on the neural endings and creating the conduction, expediting the conduction of electric impulse because not, you know, not, no energy is lost in transaction. That process happens through consolidation. Next question was about this idea of practice essential for learning, but not all practices are made created equal. So could you talk about the varied practice which seems to triumph the scene when it comes to uh, strong learning? I sure can. So the idea is that, let me talk about motor skills because that's where this this, uh, principle is most evident. Uh, The idea is that, let's say that if you want to shoot a free throw, you just, you, you keep practicing the same distance from the basket over and over again. Or in hockey, if you want to learn how to take a pass and then pass it off to somebody else quickly, a one-timer, the idea would be in hockey practice, you have a coach who might stand at the blue line and send passes to the guy who's racing down the ice. They get a pass, they one-time it. So the idea is that we actually learn more and we're more able to be adaptive if we vary that practice. So... For example, the theory is that to learn to shoot free throws, you might be better off maybe shooting one a little bit closer to the basket, maybe shooting one a little bit farther from the basket. And through this very practice, your system learns to gauge better how to make fine grain movements to shoot the ball at the right distance. In hockey, the idea would be don't practice these one-timers receiving a pass from the same place. Have the coach move around to different places of the ice to give you that pass. That's going to reinstate, really, what the realistic situation is going to be. Plus, it gives you the, it gives you experience in handling the puck from different angles and different speeds and different distances. And so that variable practice is it, it probably uh, recapitulates better the natural situation in which you have to display that performance. But even if it doesn't, even going beyond what you expect in the natural context can produce better performance. So what am I basing these statements on? I'm basing them on a a well-known study in which kids were taught to throw bean bags from a particular place on the floor to say five feet away. They were trying to hit a target. I love that study. (laughs) So you know this study, So Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, do share, though. There I think were two I groups. Think there were, okay, there were two groups. One group of children was practicing at the distance that they were going to be tested on. Let's say four feet. Another group of children was practiced on three feet and five feet, but never practiced on the test distance of four feet. Then later, a day later or so, this, the kids come back, and they're given the test, and they're asked, try to hit this target four feet away with the beanbag. And the researchers measured how close the students were to the target. And the error, that is, the amount of distance students missed was lower. That is, students missed by less, by fewer inches when they were trained on three and five feet than when they were trained on four feet. In other words, training at variable distances, none of which mimicked the actual target distance produced better performance than persistent training on the target distance. So that's the idea of variable practice. Vary the conditions of practice. It may not even have to include the eventual target you're going to be shooting for. And that's why I mentioned uh, training free throws. And it can produce better motor performance. Wonderful. So, so is it possible or is it possible to transfer? this discovery to content learning that doesn't have the motor element? It's a good question. There's (laughs) been a study on this. Uh, Roddy Rodiger, who's my co-author at Make It Stick, with his graduate student did a study where they had people trying to solve anagrams. One condition got the anagram, that is the the scrambled letter order, in exactly the same fashion as it was presented at test. Another group practiced on the same target items, say the word is elephant, but now the anagrams they practiced on were not the same rearrangements of letters as the rearrangement that was on the test. 
So that's the variable practice group. And that group solved more anagrams on the final test than the group that practiced on the very same letter rearrangements that was on the final test. So that's a direct analog to the beanbag study. Got it. So, so again, how is this, you know, like you mentioned, this uh, test distance or mm. not having, having the final questions, but getting mm. practice. So it sounds like it kind of improves your guesstimation skills. It expands your ability to kind of um, develop this context of learning. Uh, so kind of creating a room for adaptive adjustment. Is that fair to say that? Yeah, I think so. So the idea might be that you don't learn to just solve a particular specific anagram. You learn more generally approaches and executive kinds of strategies for dealing with anagrams in general. I think that would be the idea. Now, we need research to more clearly demonstrate that, but I think that would be the idea. You learn more general strategies and procedures that are effective for the domain rather than what I would say might be brittle strategy, really just a brittle memory of a particular solution. I think maybe you're learning abstractions rather than just particular examples. So this is somewhat of an analog. We know from the cognitive research on problem solving that if you give somebody a problem to study and then you later give them a new problem to try to solve and the new problem has the same underlying principles, for example, a practice problem might be that in order for a, an army to defeat a fortress, the army has to divide its forces into smaller units because the large unit cannot successfully cross the bridge that's dividing the, the attacking army from the defending army. And then you can give somebody a, a problem, a so-called x-ray problem. We have to figure out how to treat a tumor with a high dose of radiation. You don't want to destroy healthy cells on the way that that are intervening between the radiation and the tumor. And so the solution is to divide up that radiation into many different smaller doses that are targeting the tumor from different angles. And that's called the convergence solution to these problems. So people do not transfer very well when they see one analog of the convergence problem to a new convergence problem. But if they see three or four and they're prompted to try to figure out what's the underlying regularity among these different problems, now you get very good transfer to a new convergence problem. So again, the idea is if you engineer the learning situation so that people are forced to try to extract the abstract underlying principles, those get retrieved when you see a new problem with different surface features and transfer successful. On the other hand, if you just have people learn one particular problem, later when they're trying to transfer, the learner may not understand as well the underlying principles, and also they don't have retrieval cues that match up the old problem with the new problem. Yeah, and I think what's striking about this is you need decent amount of intelligence to do that, to abstract Uh, the fundamental principle that pervades information. I think that's when in my work, I see that if you apply executive strategies, which is teaching learners to look at the information and and the cohesion or similarity differences in the content, as well as kind of some sort of ways to thematically connect uh, to the larger picture, they tend to do better. But as you mentioned, otherwise, I love this term brittle memory, you know, you, otherwise everything is going to collapse and won't sustain the pressures of time. Another thing that in your book you talk about with your co-authors is this idea of elaboration, you know, connecting what you know to what you have seen or learned before, and then also connecting what you have are learning to something in your life. Do you mind talking a little bit about that process and how that works and how it helps? There are several aspects of elaboration that are very important. And one is that elaboration can help make material more meaningful to you. So we do a little demonstration at schools that has people try to learn arbitrary relations between a particular actor 
and some action. So things like the bald man climbed the ladder, the uh, nervous man got into the car, things like that. And Mm -hmm. so these things are kind of arbitrary. And the argument is, has been made by cognitive scientists, that one of the challenges for students is that much of the material that they're trying to learn seems arbitrary to them. It doesn't seem to have some logic to it. It doesn't seem to have much uh, sensibility, sense, much sense to it, even though the expert has a very good sense that the information fits together in an organized, plausible, logical manner. The student's a novice and doesn't see those relations. So elaboration helps you relating it to what you already know, relating it to personal experience, relating the material helps you make sense of the material, helps you make it less arbitrary, helps you understand it. So in our demonstrations, we say to the students, well, tell me why the bald man climbed the ladder. Well, Sujata, you might come up with a reason why the bald man climbed the ladder to reach his toupee in the closet. (laughs) Now, that's not arbitrary anymore. Now that has some meaning. Now you've related it to, to real world kinds of regularities. And At that point, the information becomes well-remembered. Understanding generates memory much more than does trying to memorize. So elaboration toward understanding leads to better memory. And that's one benefit of elaboration. That's a big benefit of elaboration. Another benefit of elaboration, and it's related, is that elaboration then, if you're relating it to what you already know, relating it to personal experience, That associates and intertwines this new material into a well-known, articulated knowledge structure that you already have. And so now you have lots of retrieval cues by which to retrieve that information. Instead of something that's kind of standing by itself, isolated in memory, you have something that's richly interconnected in your knowledge structure. And so retrieval becomes more straightforward. You have lots of ways now to help remember that information. So you create better understanding through elaboration, you create a richer retrieval structure essentially, and you then create information that's more easily retrieved and remembered. It becomes robustly encoded in a rich network rather than, as you said earlier, something that's brittle and kind of stands alone. Wow. Yeah, and I think uh, the uh, what you mentioned, I love this idea that why did the bald man climb the ladder to reach the toupee? I think this, if every teacher kind of brought the student to do this for themselves, that will be, uh, and, and then that becomes that process that they can inculcate for themselves and begin to form meaning. My favorite example I often give is when the teacher shows a video as part of history class or language arts class, whatever the class may be. And at the end, if you ask students, why did the teacher show you the video? They often say, because she can get a break. (laughs) I I like the way you're putting that. I think you've captured it, captured the essence of it beautifully in terms of the benefits of elaboration and in terms of having teachers assist students to engage in that elaboration process to help generate understanding. That's exactly the point is that we ought to encourage students to be doing that. And as they get encouraged to do that, this is going to become part of their habit, part of their orientation toward learning, instead of listening to a lecture and then going home to try to memorize it. So exactly. I, think, I think you've hit it right on the head, Sujata. Well, thank you. And so I have last two ideas. One is that a lot of wor- your work talks about this uh, shifting perspective and taking a wonderful uh, developing a wonderful attitude towards mistakes uh, as learning is uh, is taking place. And uh, Carol Dweck's work about the growth mindset uh, relates uh, to this idea also. But the most at heart of this perspective shift is that's when one can learn to teach oneself, solve personal problems, and ultimately optimize personal strategy. So talk a little bit about that. Well, to begin with, I think one of the challenges we face in the classroom and maybe as people, is that students don't like to make mistakes and we don't like to make mistakes. The idea is that we should somehow be perfect. We should always have the answers. 
and that when one gives a wrong answer, it somehow is a reflection. It's it reflects poorly on the person. <laughs> this added, we need to change this attitude by 180 degrees because it's by making mistakes, by venturing guesses, by venturing hypotheses that are sometimes going to be wrong that we learn. Most of the formal theories of learning that we have in cognitive science now are error-driven theories. That is, they learn only when mistakes are made. Learning is stimulated and supported by error. So this idea that we don't want students to make errors or that students don't think they can make errors, I think is very counterproductive. So what do errors do? Errors, as you said earlier in the podcast, Sacheta, Errors inform us directly when our thinking is not quite accurate, when our memory is not quite accurate, and only with that information can we then readjust, reflect, and take measures to correct the misunderstanding or to engage in further study so that our memory for that information improves. The issue here, Sucheta, is that our metacognitions, that is, what we know about our own cognition, our meta memory, what we know about our own meta memory is very unreliable. It's not very accurate. In every study you look at, when you ask people to predict how well they'll remember something, how well they've learned something, people are overconfident. They're overconfident. They don't have a good sense of what they've, what they're able to reproduce later, or what they've learned. Only when you allow people to test themselves or you allow people to venture guesses and get feedback is people's metacognition and meta memory becoming more accurate. Is that their metacognitions are more in line with what they actually know. So, in fact, we need the opportunity to make <laughs> errors. We need the opportunity to experience retrieval failure. We need the opportunity to uh, generate an incorrect response in order to learn where we need to, to, to work further, to understand better. So we need to give students more opportunities to make errors, to make mistakes. Now, how do you do that? It's very tough because uh, oftentimes students think they're in high stakes, high evaluation situations. And I think what we have to do is understand that testing could be used as a learning exercise. I don't even call these tests in my classroom because the students don't like it, Sucheta. It makes them nervous. They know that I'm using them for learning purposes. The value of these quizzes is very low. So we reframe them. Uh, in one class, we call them learning opportunities. They're really quizzes. In my class this semester, the students like knowledge checks. So in class this oh, semester, I love we that. call them knowledge checks. So the students are doing them as a way to check what they've learned, not as a quiz, not as a test, but it's exactly the same thing. It's retrieval practice combined with feedback, which gives the students an opportunity to do it, just their metacognition, their meta memory, so that it's more accurate. So, I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, yeah, you are just simply uh, making it less threatening and also Maybe they don't have full awareness, even though these are your undergrad or graduate, you know, psychology Under students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, undergrad students. So undergrad. Uh, probably their, <laughs> their first experience in learning to learn by reflecting on their own learning. So as we close this, can you just quickly say a few things about this uh, metacognition process, which is when you and I don't think uh, your work focuses on that, but when you have people like with ADHD they have fundamental problem with self-blindness, their mm -hmm. self-appraisal, their assessment of performance, their assessment of outcomes is off target. And then on top of that, their assessment of their capacity and skills is quite inflated. So when you take these two counteracting forces, their relationship to their own self-monitoring is really poor. And that creates a big disadvantage because then they tend to depend heavily on other people's strategy generation. And if you get a cooperative person with ADHD or learning disabilities, great. But what if they're not even cooperative on top of that, which is they have stubbornness or OCD or ODD on top of that? <laughs> well, Sujeta, that this is a hard thing for me to respond to because 
as you indicated, I don't I don't know this area at all. I haven't had experience with these kinds of learners. All of my studies have focused on the standard college student and middle school student learners, not the learners who necessarily have special challenges. So I really have little to say about that, except that I wonder, again, if the metacognitions can be can become more accurate as these types of learners are given knowledge checks, mm-hmm. uh, many knowledge checks to allow them to see that maybe performance is not as up to the level that they think that they're that they're performing at. Now, but then you've got to be able to you've got to be able to use that information to accurately adjust your metacognition and. I'm not sure whether that's happening at all either, but I think the first thing is you got to give a lot of external knowledge checks, externally generated probably to begin with knowledge checks, so that people, everybody needs to see firsthand exactly where their performance level is relative to what their metacognition is judging. Yeah, I think that that is a, a in fact, exact strategy that uh, research in TBI and uh, concussion and ADHD shows. So you hit the nail on its head again. Uh, so I really appreciate Mark. I think this was such a meaningful conversation. In closing, if you have any advice to educators regarding what should they do in terms of prioritizing uh, in, in cinching learning for students, that'll be great. And I personally learned a lot from your work as well as this book that you uh, thank you for taking the time uh, and collaboratively writing this book because it's such an important piece of information that can inform practices uh, for educators, uh, not just uh, clinicians like me. Well, thank you, Sajeta. So I I will give you uh, two closing thoughts. And I think in education, there are two challenges. One is for instructors to understand learning and to incorporate into their classes some things that will not cause extensive revision to what they're already doing now. One is to incorporate more retrieval practice, and we're seeing that. Another is to incorporate a bit more spacing into presentation of material. We didn't get a chance to talk about that, but but that's another important strategy to promote learning. Interleaving is another important strategy. So What I like to say is that you don't need to completely reinvent education. You don't need to reinvent your classroom, but with some minor adjustments, you can get big gains in learning. And we've seen this from instructors who have emailed us many, many emails from around the country that have indicated, I'm now trying some of these things, and the results are very, very satisfying. The students are doing better. Performance is better. The second point is that I believe that we need to help students develop these learning strategies because you can teach the best class in the world. Your classroom can be vibrant and engaged, but it remains that the student still has to leave the classroom and figure out how to learn the material on their own. They've got to go back to the room, to the library, wherever they study, and they've got, they need to be using effective study strategies. So I think we need to find ways to help students develop that and One thing I'm working on now, in fact, I'm teaching a course this semester, an experimental course on applying the science of learning, informing students about these strategies, having them practice them in other courses, reflecting on them, and developing their own personal portfolio or toolkit of learning strategies. I think we need to do that, too. The way I look at it, I don't know if this uh, will resonate with you, Sujeta, but if you have kids, you would never ever, ever throw your kid in the deep end of a swimming pool and say, (laughs) get to the shore. You'd never do that because you know that the kid has to be taught how to learn to swim. Now, if you did that and didn't teach the kid how to learn to swim, what's going to happen? Many are not going to make it. Some are going to figure it out. I think this is the state of education today. We're throwing kids into the deep end of learning and we're saying, figure it out, learn. Some are making it. Some are um, drowning. And what we need to do, what we would do in any other domain, teaching a sport, teaching music, teaching swimming, is we help students acquire the skills that allow them to be successful in whatever it is we're challenging them with.
And I think we need to do more of that in education. Brilliant. And I, I would love to offline find a little bit more about your success of this particular class that you're talking about. Quickly, I will end with my personal experience. This is exactly what I teach in my private practice in a group setting. But again, as you mentioned, this is not happening in the class. It's happening in a form, in a simulated class, but outside the classroom where the student is actually learning content. And so learning to learn should be explicitly taught and explicitly learned. And then that intention of behind learning should be self-checked so that the student can problem solve. Finally, I'll, uh, I think uh, I've talked to the listeners before about uh, a software that I'm, I have, uh, which is called EXQ, where the entire focus of the software is to teach this process of learning how to learn and help students develop their personal strategy portfolio so that it's uh, guided by uh, the system or me, but eventually is inculcated as a personal you know, beacon uh, of self-guided uh, learning. So thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing your wisdom once again and uh, being so generous towards all the listeners of uh, Full Prefrontal. I really appreciate it, Mark. So Jeff has been enjoyable as usual. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you enjoyed yeah. today's episode, we'd sure appreciate if you would forward it to a friend or colleague who might just benefit. So on behalf of our host, Ucheta Kamath, today's guest, Dr. Mark McDaniel, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thank you for listening today. We look forward to seeing you again right here next week on Full Prefrontal. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.